Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wolfpacker Show. My name is Ethan McDowell. I am here with Noah Fleischman. We're here to talk a lot about Wolfpack basketball and a lot about Wolfpack football. We're going to hit all three teams today, talk about um, the season openers for NC State's men's and women's basketball teams before diving into our usual weekly preview of the football team. This week, the football team is playing Duke. It's an in-state matchup. Noah, did you know they've only played twice in the past decade? These two programs, they are just right down the road from each other, but they don't get to see each other often. Now, under the uh, ACC's new scheduling model, they will see each other every single year. So it's been a rivalry for a long time in basketball. Now we can start to see one start to build in football as well. And that starts Saturday. Before we dive into um, you know, our recaps and our previews, just want to quickly mention, we're both writers for thewolfpacker.com. That's NC State's site on the On3 network, the fastest growing college football, basketball recruiting site out there. Whether you're looking for you know, a growing message board community, recruiting scoops, team analysis, long in-depth feature stories, it's all on thewolfpacker.com. We are churning out the content for you guys over there. And right now, you can join thewolfpacker.com. For 50% off an annual subscription, that comes out to just under $5 a month for that deal. And um, it's pretty great. It's a, you know, cuts that cost in half. And um, it's about as cheap as you, you'll you get for an annual subscription for um, one of these team recruiting sites. And I think it's well worth the money, in my opinion. So go check out thewolfpacker.com. It is a busy stretch of the year with both basketball and football happening, as well as signing day. It's only one less than a month away, Noah. So we are really entering the home stretch and approaching silly season quite quickly when, you know, that's always fun to cover as well. So Noah, on that note, let's dive in to some basketball talk. We're going to talk about some Wolfpack hoops at the top of the show. Um, let's start with the game you covered. NC State hosted USC Upstate. They raised a banner. They won 97 to 66. It was just seemed like a day of celebration where everything was pretty straightforward for the pack. But um, I want to hear your thoughts, your observations on um, the season opening win for the men's basketball team. Yeah, they put two banners up in the, in the Lenovo Center Raptors for the first time in a while, which was a good sight. Crowd was into it early on, and NC State did not have a problem it had last week in its exhibition win over Lee's McCray. It got a lead, and it stomped on that lead moving forward, did not let it up. They beat USC Upstate 97 to 66, the decisive 31 point win over a team that they should beat. And they played really, really well. And they shot the ball 56%, despite only making nine of their 27 threes. Free throw shooting was abysmal at 57%, but that didn't end up mattering as NC State scored 27 points off 17 boards turnovers to go fast. They want to play fast this year, Ethan. They did that. They it kind of hurt them early on. They had eight, they had nine turnovers in the first half. Kind of was a little ugly. Only two in the second half. They, they cleaned things up, and they looked really, really good. Marcus Hill and Breon Pass leading the way with 14 points each. Ben Middlebrooks, his second career double-double. 10 points, 10 rebounds. They played well, and uh, we'll see what they can do to build off of that. But we really balanced scoring for the most part. Something that Kevin Keats expects to be a trend this year. He does not expect to see a DJ Horn with somebody who scores 30 a night. Um, but I'm sure he'd take it if somebody ends up doing that. Yeah, so the starting lineup in this game was Dontre Styles, Marcus Hill, Jaden Taylor, Michael O'Connell, and Ben Middlebrooks. Three members of the Final 14 from last year. From that, I think I feel like that's pretty close to what we expected the starting lineup to be this year. Um, maybe the one surprise being um, Brandon Huntley Hatfield not being in the starting lo- lineup. Do you f- feel like that five is the five we're going to see moving forward, or do you think we could see adjustments? What, what's kind of the vibe you're getting there? I think it is. I think, you know, Ben Rudbrooks and Brandon Huntley Hatfield are pretty interchangeable in the starting lineup. Kevin Keats talked about he started Ben to reward Ben. Ben, you know, he didn't feel like Ben was practicing well um, and sat him down right, you know, after the exhibition game. It was like, I need you to be aggressive. I need you to go get boards. He said the next day he's looking like Dennis Rodman on the basketball court, go and get every single board. So they rewarded him for his increased effort in practice. It will continue. I'm not sure. They both played similar minutes, you know, 20 minutes for Ben, 17 for Brandon Huntley Hatfield. Um, they both pick up two quick fouls. Ben played clean throughout the rest of the game without them. Hatfield ended up with four fouls. Um, he did score 13 points with four boards. They were both really, really uh, you know, efficient. Ben was five of eight from the field. Huntley Hatfield was five of six. So, I mean, 
And all in all, they're interchangeable guys. And I think NC State will roll with it, um, both of them throughout the game. They had them on the court together for a little bit, but I wouldn't expect to see them play much, especially right now without Ismail Diouf being eligible to play for, for Friday night's game against Presbyterian. I, I think it's one of those things where they're going to start one, shove them off the other, and kind of play pretty balanced as we saw them split basically the playing time, 20 minutes and 17 minutes each. Yeah, and, you know, over the next three weeks, exactly three weeks actually, Actually, they're going to have plenty of time to experiment with different lineups. They, their next game will be against Presbyterian tomorrow night, tip off at 7 p.m., and that's Friday night, just so we date this episode. Um, and then in it's Coastal Carolina, Colgate, William & Mary, and then a ranked Purdue team, Final Four rematch on November 28th. So that's when we'll really start to learn things about this team. But um, they have weeks to figure things out and kind of establish a rhythm as a team. Um, a team that does not have as much time to figure out a rhythm is the women's basketball team. The number 19 ranked Wolfpack also improved to 1-0, but it was less pretty. Um, the pack ended up pulling away and winning 80-55, to but only led by three points at halftime, turned the ball over 12 times. Um, to put it you know, plainly, Noah, it was ugly in the in the first half the offense looked completely disjointed and um they were turning the ball over constantly whether it was offensive fouls poor entry passes just being loose with the ball it took a while for this team to start to build any sort of momentum on the court really and uh, when they figured it out they figured it out and uh, they won the fourth quarter 23 to 8 more so the result that i think wolfpack fans were expecting and um, they pulled away, won very comfortably. Um, Zoe Brooks scored a career high, 21 points in that matchup. Isaiah James um, didn't take too many shots and still finished with 17 points and also nine rebounds to lead the pack. So this is going to be a guard-oriented team this year as um, you know the younger post players just continue to grow. And we saw a little bit of that where you know when a couple of them heat up, they they look like one of the best teams in the country when um, the a team is defending them well on the perimeter, things are probably going to look a little bit difficult this season because they don't have a River Baldwin or a Mimi Collins to go to in the post this season. But we'll see how that position develops. Again, only one game into the season. Um, James Brooks and Madison Hayes had all missed time during the preseason, didn't play in the exhibition game. So this team still needs some time to click. But um, they've got – South Carolina on Sunday, Noah. So no, no rest for them. It's going to be a big, big test. Another Final Four rematch against the top-ranked Gamecocks. And um, that's going to be a really fun one in Charlotte at um, 3 p.m. ESPN broadcast. A huge national stage for NC State. Um, for those who remember, they uh, beat UConn in the second game of last season. I believe second-ranked UConn. So they have a chance to one-up themselves this year with this matchup against South Carolina. Um, but that's really the only takeaways I have from this game. It, once they got going, they took control, and it was pretty easy, man. All right, should we dive into some football talk, Noah? Talk about yeah, um, I think we should. the Blue Devils? Um, yeah, let's talk about some Blue Devils. The Wolfpack will welcome said Duke football team to Carter-Finley Stadium for the final time this year which feels really weird to say because it is going to be November 9th and they're going to have senior day on November 9th because after this, it's a bye week and then a Thursday night matchup on the road against Georgia Tech and then the quick trip over to Chapel Hill to end the regular season. So senior day comes a little early this year and um, the Wolfpack for the first time this year is on a winning streak. Uh, no, I just want to get your gut check. How are you feeling about this matchup? Yeah, I feel like this is a matchup NC State could win. Um, they're on their first winning streak of the season. Two wins in a row going into senior day. You know the teams play a little bit more inspired football when they know it's their last time for their seniors playing at home. Duke and NC State's an interesting matchup for sure. This was a team that really made NC State look at itself in the mirror a year ago with a 24-3 loss in Durham. Probably one of the worst losses that NC State has had in recent years, just, just on the, you know, not the, not the fact of who they played, but the way they played. And, and yeah. it was not executed at all. This year, Ethan, they're playing a Duke team that is pretty good defensively. But offensively, it's not so good. And it gives an opportunity for NC State's defense to show up to the party and help, you know, kind of 
lean on them a little bit and uh, keep NC State in the game. The Blue Devils boast the 13th best passing offense in the league at 192 yards and the 15th best rushing attack at just 107 yards a game. So while the defense has been up and down, Ethan, this is an opportunity for them to continue playing well as they did against Stanford, and we'll see if they can do it again this week. Yeah, um, Duke six and three, and lo- has lost his past two games. Got off to a six and one start, and I think it's safe to say they're well ahead of schedule from where folks thought they would be this year under first year head coach Manny Diaz, a familiar name. He coached in Raleigh and also, you know, coach was the head coach of Miami as well. And um, so far, they have power four wins over Florida State, UNC, and Northwestern. Not exactly the best competition there, right? And then they, they did beat a good UConn team as well. That is worth um, worth noting. But um, they've lost game, the past two weeks to SMU in Miami. And they – you're right. They have struggled offensively a little. It's, it's strange when you look at their stats, man. They're, they're led by soft, sophomore quarterback Malik Murphy, a Texas transfer – who you know, was a huge big-time recruit, um, and then they recruited over him when they brought Arch Manning in, so we transferred to Duke. Um, he is a very talented quarterback. He is not a very accurate quarterback. He's completing 58.9% of his passes this year. And Noah, when you go and watch his games, he's throwing that ball up. He, will, he does not hesitate to try out the deep ball. He has 52 passes of 20 yards or more downfield so far this year, and he's completing 38, 30.8% of those attempts for seven touchdowns and four picks. There's a lot of times, and this was especially prevalent against Miami when he threw a few um, interceptions, is he's just throwing it up there and letting his receivers make plays, and he has a very talented group of receivers led by Jordan Moore. Um, a graduate who NC State fans should be familiar with. He's been in the ACC for it feels like a while, um, but he's a really good player. Um, he has 22 contested catch opportunities this season. <laughs> like he, in, um, in, Duke is giving him a chance to just win jump balls, and he's caught nine of those passes. Um, has dropped four, and um, leads the team 556 yards and five touchdowns, averaging a career best 14.3 yards per reception. So that connection is going to be the connection to watch downfield. He's they're really their only downfield consistent threat. So they're going to throw the ball up and um, see what happens. It's going to be a big game for NC State's corners, I think. I wrote about that this morning. I anticipate that if NC State's corners play well, assuming Brandon C. stays still healthy and plays, it could be a big game for him and Aiden White, two guys that are used to being on an island, and I think they're going to be on an island again and have a chance to um, change the game, quite frankly. Um, Noah, is there anything else you took away from um, Duke's offense? Yeah, I mean, when you look at their numbers, they don't run the ball well, but Star Thomas is, you know, their leading rusher at 706 yards. He's averaging 4.3 yards a carry, you know, five touchdowns. He's an effective runner. He's got a lot of attempts this year. Um, but they're, they're not afraid to run the ball with him, and especially against an NC State defense that's given up a lot of rushing yards the last few weeks. I would expect Duke to try to pound the rock and see what happens, um, especially with you know Malik Murphy being a guy that can make big plays, but he also does have eight interceptions this year. And, you know, and it's kind of one of those things they might lean on the running a little bit more than they might have anticipated if they can find success because Stanford found success, especially in running with the quarterback. Uh, Malik Murphy is not a mobile guy. 14 carries for negative 66 yards. This year he's been sacked 10 times. His longest run is eight yards. He's not going to be a guy that takes off and runs. Um, so they don't have to worry about that, but they do need to worry about, you know, the running backs that while they haven't shown a lot this year, they're still, you know, really, really good guys. Yeah, definitely. It's a talented backfield. Um, I think, you know, yeah, you can point to the fact that they have struggled this year, Noah, but NC State's given up rushing yards to other teams that have struggled on the ground. Um, that's just how it's going to be, and I, I totally agree. I expect um, Duke to lean on its rushing attack, even though it has struggled because when they do get the running game going, they have shown a willingness to rely on it. During you know a really exciting 20-point comeback win over UNC, they handed the ball off to Star Thomas 30 times. <laughs> he racked up 166 yards and scored a touchdown. But um, yeah, they're not going to hesitate to run the ball if they can find success doing so against NC State. So 
I'm anticipating that he's State's going to have to stack the box to stop Star. Um, he's six foot and 210 pounds, so he's not a small running back either. But uh, they're going to have to load up the box, put an extra body in there to contain him, if I had to guess. And then that's going to open up these one-on-one opportunities in the passing game. We're going to – I think the winner of this game – it could simply come down to who's winning those one-on-one battles on, you know, Malik's deep throws and stuff like that. Cause also when they're not chucking the ball 40 yards downfield, Noah, they are throwing screen passes. They're, they are going to throw a lot of screen passes. About 20% of their passing attempts are screens. So they're going to try to get the ball in a couple of their, you know, receivers hands who are really good after the catch. Right. And they're going to try to, make things happen and make things easier for um, for Malik Murphy and see what happens there. Uh, but they have two receivers that have over 200 yards after the catch this year, and that's because of the screen game. And NC State's going to have to do a good job getting off of blocks, going to have to do a good job tackling. It's just going to – I can't overemphasize, no, this is going to be a big test for the secondary. We're going to have to see how the secondary plays um, when they're at, asked to do a lot in this game. Um, we don't have – a um, update on Devin Boykin. Um, it's been talked about, like, I mean, Dave Doran's talked about it, that he could return for the final four games. He did not play, obviously, against uh, against Stanford. But if he was out there for this game, I think that kind of be a game changer because he's, in addition to just being a really um, talented player, he's one of the smartest football players I've seen play for NC State over the past few years. He diagnoses screen plays like that. He's really, really good in that area of the game. And I think it'd be super helpful to have him out there if this is the game where he is healthy and able to return from his ACL injury last year. So that's something to monitor. Um, switching sides of the ball, Noah. Uh, anything you've noticed about Duke's defense, how they are going to try to slow down C.J. Bailey and the Wolfpack offense overall? Yeah, they're going to try to make the Wolfpack run the ball. NC State hasn't really done that a whole lot. They did against Stanford. They had a couple of explosive runs, pad those numbers to 100-yard rushers for the first time and since 2021 in the same game. Duke has the best passing defense in the ACC, 192 yards. That's all they give up. C.J. Bailey has been one of the best passers in the ACC the last few weeks. So it's going to be a strength-on-strength strength matchup in that sense, and I'm really excited to see it. He's a freshman that has grown week to week but he hasn't really played an elite pass defense like this. At Cal, he did. He played an elite corner in Noel yeah. Williams, and he played well against them. Did not throw a pick. Not worried about him throwing interceptions. I'm just worried about, you know, pushing the ball downfield. Duke did not allow that with their, you know, corners on the outside. So that's going to be the thing to watch, you know, from my point of view, is how does C.J. Bailey respond playing another elite pass defense? He did against did well against Cal. Now we'll see what he can do against the team that's a little closer to home and at home. I personally am a little worried about interceptions in this game um, because, like you said, Duke's passing defense is really, really good. And they are in the top five in interceptions and sacks this year. So they are going to be able to pressure CJ most likely. And um, if he puts the ball in harm's way, Duke's defense is opportunistic. They're going to take advantage of that. I think CJ has done an outstanding job of not putting the ball in harm's way over the past couple of weeks. But um, I think we would have to see a performance very similar to the Cal game, um, which was a a really freaking good performance by CJ. So we'll see if he's able to replicate that against a defense that I think is just as good, if not better, than the Golden Bears. Um, The bottom line is NC State ran the ball better than it has all year against Stanford, right? And as a result, the offense looked better than it has looked all year. Duke is a worse rushing defense than Stanford. They have been able to limit teams and you know keep points off the board. And before giving up 50 to Miami, I believe they were the top scoring defense in the conference before last week. Uh, they've been able to do all of that while giving up 156.6 yards per game on the ground. If I thought NC State's offensive line played great against Stanford, and then I thought the running backs played their best game of the game of the year because Jordan Waters and Hollywood were both breaking tackles were super elusive and we're not letting safeties and corners bring them down. They were running right through those arm tackles, right? 
if we see something similar to that, I'm not expecting to see them rip off two touchdowns of 50 yards or more necessarily. If NC State stays ahead of the chains in this game, literally just averaging like four, four and a half yards per carry, just keeping NC State in the second and medium, third and short situations, then I think C.J. Bailey will be able to pick this defense apart just because the passing offense, when it's clicking, has the potential to be really awesome, as we've seen over the past couple of weeks. But if they're not able to get a consistent running game going and they're in third and long situations, that's an area where the Wolfpack has struggled this year. And that is an area where the Duke defense really thrives with, as you can see, with their sack numbers, their interception numbers. So that's something we're going to have to keep an eye on, man. They're going to have to stay ahead of the chains. If they can do that, I fully expect this offense to keep rolling. And I think uh, if they do that, I think the NC State's going to win the game full stop. That would make me very confident. If if, if you could tell me, if Noah from the future joined this podcast and was like, hey, Ethan, NC State's going to have three or less third and nine situations. I'd be like, all right, cool. So how much did they win by? So th- that's kind of where I'm at with um, watching Duke's defense and seeing how they – because the only team they've really gotten beaten bad by was Miami and Cam Ward. I mean, he's arguably the best player in the country. So can't really fault them for that. But, yeah, man, any other, any other just general observations on Duke before we kind of dive into the predictions portion? Yeah, I do look at this game as kind of a, a get-back game for NC State. They felt, you know, embarrassed a year ago in Durham. And and Dave Dorn is not the kind of coach to really say that. He took that loss. That might be one of the t- toughest losses he's taken in a while in, in his coaching career. He's not going to say it out loud this week that, you know, he really wants to get this win. But I think internally, you know, inside his head, inside the Murphy Center, he definitely wants to get this win, wants to deliver the same blow to Manny Diaz and the Blue Devils. Well, Diaz wasn't the coach at the time. He still wants to hand them the same, you know, taste of, of what they went through. Um, NC State does have Jordan Waters on the team, who ran all over NC State's defense last year for Duke. So they have that. Um, we'll see what happens. But I do think this is a game that NC State's players will play inspired football for. And if they win, we'll probably see a pretty big reaction from the locker room after, not only for getting back and beating Duke, but for reaching bowl eligibility for the fifth straight year, which is, you know, an impressive feat in itself. I think the team's going to be really fired up for this one. I, I think you're totally right. The players that are back from last year, I think you hit the nail on the head with, I think that loss really hurt them. Like, I, I think they took that really personally, just in the manner in which it happened, like you said. Um, and Dave Dorn talked about it on Monday. It was a situation where they were not only outplayed, but also outcoached. So I, I think this is one that the staff, because, you know, everyone's back from the staff, and then the players who were you know, there or here last year, I think they're going to be fired up. This is a game they want to win because it is, like we said at the top of the show, becoming a rivalry. This is becoming a rivalry matchup for NC State. And um, they recruit against these guys. They, A lot of the players know each other. They're from similar areas of North Carolina, South Carolina. They recruit, heck, similar areas of Georgia against each other. So this is going to be a matchup that means a little extra. And um, I'm kind of excited about that. I, I'm looking forward to seeing how this rivalry grows, you know, because um, it's, 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 it's a shame that they had only played one time since 2013 before last year. Right. So it's going to be, um, it's going to be fun to see We're, it's going to be an interesting matchup, man. But, you know, before every game, we like to kind of dive into some predictions We'll share our game scores and then also talk about who we think is going to lead the team in several statistical categories. Um, no, let's start with that this week. Um, we've talked a lot about the running game today, but uh, who are you going to pick to lead the team in rushing? We go with Hollywood Smothers. I think, you know, he's just proven to be one of the m- most consistent, elusive backs. Yes, we saw Jordan Waters get involved. He only, you know, ran for, for 115 yards and five carries, a 95, you know, a 94 yard rushing touchdown. Um, you know, help pad those numbers. So give me Hollywood Smothers to lead the way. But Jordan Waters, I do think, will play an inspired game against his old team. Yeah, here you go. Um, Jordan Waters cancels out his 83-yard touchdown run against NC State 
um, last year by ripping off a, say, 40-plus yard touchdown run this week against Duke, against his former team. Um, I mean, yeah, that I'm sure this game is going to be an emotional one for him. Um, of course, he spent a long time at Duke before joining the Wolfpack, and uh, I'm going to pick him to lead the team in rushing. I think it could be him or Hollywood. I thought it was noteworthy that Hollywood played so many more snaps than the rest of that backfield in um in last week's game. Like he is clearly the feature back in this offense, but um just for the sake of um good podcasting, I'll go with Jordan Waters here who made the most of his carries against Stanford and um was really really explosive. This was his best like tackle breaking performance we had seen since the Western Carolina game. And I think he has a shot. I think he has a shot to lead the team in rushing and um, make it an exciting performance without a doubt. What about receiving? Uh, Justin Jolie, still the Pack's leading receiver this year. He's been consistent and great. He caught another touchdown against Stanford. Um, are you going to pick him to lead the re- team in receiving, or are you going to go in a different direction here, Noah? Yeah, I'm going to pick Justin Jolie. I think he's going to do it again. I think he's going to do it again on not that many – catches he's just a guy that can find his way open downfield can make contested crabs when he needed to so give me the tight end to lead them in receiving yeah i can't really argue with that pick <laughs> i mean he's he's it's the consistency that's really stood out to me man i think um he is like the safety blanket for cj honestly when a play C- cj likes to extend plays um, get out of the pocket a little bit, make throws on the run, something he, he's really good at. Honestly, I think to me, that's the most impressive part of his game as a freshman. And um, Justin Jolie's really good at sticking with the play, finding open space and um, making the catch when he has the opportunity. That's what happened on his touchdown last week. And um, yeah, I think safe pick to pick him to lead the team in receiving. I'm going to go with KC here. I think they've been slowly getting him more and more involved in the offense. Um, you know, he's had 46 yards against Syracuse, 53 against Cal and 30 against Stanford. Still not the numbers that he was accustomed to, but it at least seems like they're getting him more opportunities downfield. They've used him as in the wildcat a little bit in, or taking handoffs in the red zone. He has back back to back weeks with rushing touchdowns, which I thought, thought is interesting. Makes sense. He's a tough runner. But um, I'm going to pick him to have a little bit of a breakout game, lead the team in receiving, and, um, I don't know, maybe rip off some big yards after the catch plays against the Blue Devils. What about um, defensively? Tackling-wise, it has been kind of a committee approach. Um, Sean Brown is the team's leading tackler right now. He made the Buckkiss Awards semifinalist list, one of 15 linebackers in the country to receive that honor. Um who, Noah, who do you think will lead the pack in tackles against Duke? I'm going to go with an underrated pick, but a guy that is playing really good football right now and is, is going to probably be big for next year. But I'm going to go with Kamal Bonner. You like know, he's, in the last three games, he's had at least seven tackles. I think this is his opportunity to break out. Double-digit tackles incoming for Kamal Bonner. Yeah, he's been good. I, 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 um, I, I mean, it's also – of course, maybe he's just improved a lot as the season goes along. But, man, I kind of wish we had seen more of him early in the year. You know, he, he's been really, really productive when he's on the field. He's flying around, and he's showcasing the potential that's had. The coach is speaking highly of him really since he arrived on campus. He's been someone that has impressed the staff. Um, and we've talked about it before. He was a safety in high school and um, flies around the field, super athletic, hits hard, and um, – is making some exciting plays, and I think he is definitely an important part of the future of that linebacker room. I'm going to go with Sean um, to lead the team in tackles. He has 63 so far this year, 31 solo. I think this is going to be a game where the linebackers are going to have to step up and make some plays to make sure Duke stays behind the chains and put them in difficult down and distance situations. And um, I'll go with Sean, who – He's had at least six tackles in each of his past three games to um, lead the pack. But it's going to be a committee approach. It has been all year. So it's going to be every member of this defense. I'm sure DK Kaufman's going to play a big role in run support this week. Um, Bishop Fitzgerald has been awesome in run support over the past couple of games. 
I think it's, it's going to have to be a team effort as far as that goes, as far as stopping the run goes. It's going to be that way for the rest of the year, folks. And then it's up to the DBs to make some plays in those one-on-one situations. Um, they've talked about in the past how much they like having those chances to make a play on an island, and we'll see how it goes Saturday. And going off of that, Noah, who's winning this football game? Give me your game score prediction for NC State versus Duke. Yeah, I've got NC State winning 35-28. C.J. Bailey finds a way to get the ball downfield. He puts up another monster beam through the air, and NC State's defense does enough to uh, win the game. I have a similar prediction. I'm going to go pack, just barely ekes it out, maybe a game-winning field goal in the final minutes. And I think it's they're going to win this game 24-23 to because – their running game actually takes a ste- another step forward. I think we will see the pack get at least 175 rushing yards in this game. They're going to rack up some just consistency on the ground paired with a couple more explosive runs by Hollywood or Jordan, just because I think they're showing now that they're breaking more tackles. They're more elusive. And I think they're going to be able to have some success against a Duke rushing defense that yes, their defense overall is better than Stanford, but their rushing defense is worse. We have to overstate that. Stanford had a good rushing defense going into the game against NC State. So I don't think that was a flash in the pan. I think we're seeing actual improvement from this rushing attack. And that's going to make this a really close game. But the pack is going to just barely eke out a win on senior day and head into its second bye week on a three-game winning streak. All right. Folks, that is today's show. We appreciate you all tuning in and um, sticking with us for the past half hour. We will be back on Sunday to talk about whatever happened and um, maybe talk about Friday's men's basketball game as well. Um, We will see you all then, and thank you for tuning in tonight.